Monticello is now open for tours. The wine cellar um, is now open. Justin Serafin, the curator, will be in the wine cellar. Um, the grounds and the vineyard are open for you to tour. And the food and wine tables are open again. Enjoy. Oh, yep, yeah, absolutely. Yep, yeah, just been open for about a year. Not even quite a year. And uh, this was a really fun project. <clears throat> so many facets to Jefferson and wine, you know, just besides, but then you start getting into some of these historic fabric built details or some of the material culture associated with wine. And I mean, this is years of my life, actually. <laughs> well, I know he was, you know, passionate about mm -hmm. French wine mm -hmm. and spent a, a sizable amount of his income, uh -huh. which That's was right. not, which was pretty sizable for the time. Right. Right. He, you know, after he spent five years in Europe, you know, he's primarily in France and did a couple of sort of grand vineyard tours through France and Germany. Uh, at that point, he he was well versed in you know, what they were what they were offering, um, sort of in in contrast to the typical Anglo-American uh, taste for fortified ports and Madeiras and that type of thing. Uh, so after he comes back from Europe, I mean, he's very fixated on the French Reds, the German Whites, and uh, goes to pretty great lengths to obtain them. Uh, what we're really illustrating in this space, you don't you, you don't see a single cask here. Okay. The the story is the bottle. Jefferson uh, exploits pretty effectively some of the contacts he made in Europe. Writes directly to vineyard owner, owners to say, you know, if you could do it, I'd love, you know, X bottles of such and such year. Um, bottle it there. I'll pay you for the bottling, pack it securely in, in boxes, and ship it directly to me. Um, that, we take state bottling for granted today, uh, but at the time was very atypical. Uh, and so, you know, the normal practice was vineyards are kind of setting off their wine, it all goes to merchants. Merchants, usually in a, a less than... Um, how shall I say, less than um, knowledgeable way and less than um, uh, truthful sort of way. And they water it down. Watering down, blending, well, uh, it, it, adulterating in whatever well. fashion. And then that's what was being sent over. So Jefferson uh, specifically says that, you know, ordering right from the source, you know, he's ensuring wine of the first quality. Um, he, got his, he got his friends to buy it too, didn't he? Well, he, and he was... Yes, he was, I mean, at the point at which he comes back, he is advising Washington, you know, Monroe, Madison, you know, those guys later in the, are in the president's house after he is, and he's saying, well, you know, here's, here's what you need to order. This is what you need to be serving at the president's house. So he really set the standard for one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, really, he's, he's really the kind of first American connoisseur, really. I mean, because he, he's... He's the first to really break out of the, the you know, like I say, that, that kind of 18th, early 18th century Anglo-American um, fortified wine drinking habit. But that's what, that's what bore transportation here from Europe. Uh, well, I mean, via, you know, sort of all over. But uh, it's the ports and Madeiras, that's what made it here in Cask. In fact, they found after a while that the boat trips actually you know, improved it. Um, and so uh, the, the, you know, the non-fortified stuff, that was, you know, that was pretty atypical here. He still ordered the fortified wines uh, to have some on hand because it was, you know, his wine tastes were pretty exclusive, all things considered. You know, so he's still ordering some of that to have on hand for guests and whatnot. Um, but primarily, for his tastes, you know, he's he's doing the he's doing the lighter reds and whites. So it's it's a really it's a really fascinating story. Um, if you ever get a chance, well, I mean, or if you ever feel like writing a dissertation or 
or whatnot on it. Um, there's a great so research for this restoration. Uh, looking through a lot of his so his his correspondence or his his own travel notes for himself. If you were to put sort of look at his travel notes and his rankings of vineyards as he's traveling, you line it up with the 1850s classifications, they basically parallel one another. It, you know, and he, so that's foreshadowing that by what, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80, you know, 90, 80, 90 years. Um, and it's, it's almost uncanny how, <laughs> how alike those two, you know, his kind of saying, well, you know, this is absolutely the best and first quality, and, you know, and if, if you couldn't get that, I'd go with this. And, I mean, it, it perfectly mirrors the, you know, sort of Grand Cru, you know, all the way down. It's it's uncanny. Really? Yeah, it's very interesting. So he had an exceptional palate. He had good he taste. Did, he did. He did. I, I mean, I think he he must have, you know, just really devoted himself to, to the study of it. Of course, you know, at that time, there's, there was no study of it. It was it was an experiential thing, I guess. Uh, you know, it was about being there, tasting one versus the other, and then you know, coming up with this ranking. It's just it's really fascinating. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, it's neat. That's neat. Justin <laughs> Serafin. Serafin, yes. All right, Thomas Jefferson Foundation. Yep, uh, hey. I I work here. Oh, I'm a curator here. Oh, thanks, Justin. Hmm. You're very welcome.